Berkeley. For, <laughs> oh, for undergrad. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a lot of connections, I think, between the people at Berkeley and, uh, yeah. and, and, and Harvard. And she's going to tell us about priors and when they're important, when they're not, <laughs> et cetera, which, which goes back to things we heard on the first day. Great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uncertainty quantification and robustness quantification in Bayesian inference. Uh, and so I think that means that I'll be talking a lot about uh, Bayesian inference. So let me start by saying that there's a lot to like about Bayesian inference. Uh, it lets us have rich hierarchical models of complex physical phenomenon, but also in general complex relationships in your data. So you might have a bunch of studies that you've done and you want to share power across those studies, but maybe also want to recognize that there could be idiosyncrasies among those studies. Um, also, one of the nice things about Bayesian statistics is that when there's some parameter that we're interested in learning about, it gives us a full distribution over the values of that parameter to express our knowledge. So if we're interested in a point estimate, we can query that distribution for a mean or a median. If we're interested in an uncertainty, we can query that distribution for a covariance or quantiles. If you're interested in a tail probability, that comes from the distribution. If you're interested in higher order moments, at least theoretically, that's all in this distribution. So that's nice. And in general, I, I want to emphasize, too, that there are a lot of problems where we really do want to go beyond point estimates. Let's say you're making some investment and uh, you're interested in what's the expected value of your investment. Well, you might make a really different investment if your expected value is $1,000 plus or minus $10 versus if it's $1,000 plus or minus a million dollars. So these can make really big differences in decisions. Okay, so the way that Bayesian inference works is we start by having some prior distribution expresses what we know about the parameter before going into the experiment and getting our data. And typically this will be a bit more diffuse because we maybe don't know as much. But then we gather our data and we modify the prior according to the likelihood, the probability of the data given the parameter. And then finally, Bayes' theorem, which is just a fact of probability, tells us how to finally say, you know, at the end, after we've seen all of the data, what's our distribution, our, our belief about the parameter, given the data we've seen. Now, in theory, this is all very easy. We just immediately plug into this formula and we're done. But in practice, of course, there are a lot of different challenges in actually using this formula. And I think, you know, the one that it just immediately comes up here is, how do I actually choose this prior? And for that matter, actually, how do I choose this likelihood, which we should be asking ourselves, but I'm going to focus on the prior for the moment. You know, how do, am I going to express my prior beliefs in a distribution? So there's actually this whole um, giant literature on prior elicitation, how to, how to take your prior beliefs and put them into a distribution. But the fact of the matter is, I'm sitting down, I only have a limited amount of time. Even if I do everything in exactly the right way, as somebody tells me to do, I might not get all of my information out into a distribution. And so this could be too time consuming, and I might be uncertain about exactly which distribution I have at the end of the process. It could also be a bit subjective. You ask me my prior today and you ask me my prior a week from now, I might come up with slightly different answers. Or I might have a prior and I ask you, you pri your prior and you have something slightly different. And so what we want to know is if we're going to do Bayesian inference um, and we have these slightly different priors that we think are both reasonable, are they going to lead to essentially the same inference, in which case we're not so concerned, or are they going to lead to fundamentally different posterior inference and different decisions, in which case then we're a bit more concerned. We might have to sort of, you know, step back and either get more data or spend more time getting our prior together or in some way revise our analysis. So in general, what we really want is we want to be able to say, okay, I chose some prior. I'm going to do my analysis. But if I perturb that prior a little bit, if I changed it a little bit, would that give me this fundamentally different inference out at the end? So we want to quantify how robust our inference is um, to, to this choice of prior. And let me just mention that all of these problems are exacerbated in the sort of modern complex models that we're interested in, um, because there we're having some maybe some deep hierarchy, and these parameters don't necessarily correspond to something physically meaningful anymore, and it's going to be even harder to say something necessarily about that parameter. OK, so we want this sort of robustness quantification. How much, if I perturb my prior, does that change my inference at the end of the day? And this isn't a new idea. People have wanted this kind of robustness quantification for years and, and decades now. And yet, it's rarely used in practice. If you see it in practice, it'll often be of the form of, you know, I ran for some hyperparameters my, my whole Bayesian posterior inference, and I ran for some other hyperparameters my whole Bayesian posterior inference. But it's not very systematic. We don't know, you know, if we perturb in all the directions uh, of the choices we might have made, how that would change 
the posterior inference. And I think that the reason for this has to do with another challenge of Bayesian inference in general, which is that in general, when we have a complex model, it's actually quite difficult to just solve for this equation. Uh, we, in general, can't just solve for it exactly. We have to approximate the posterior somehow. Now, the way that people have often traditionally done this is Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, in providing this sort of empirical estimate of our distribution, isn't really amenable to the kind of perturbation that I was describing, perturbing the prior and getting something out different at the end. And so um, not only that, but Markov chain Monte Carlo can be computationally expensive. And so there are various reasons that we might want to move away from Markov chain Monte Carlo. And in particular, in this talk, I'll be focusing on variational Bayes as an alternative method to get a posterior approximation. And so now we want to ask ourselves, OK, well, variational Bayes is all well and good, but it has some problems too. It tends to underestimate the uncertainty in the posterior. But of course, as I said earlier, we really care about the uncertainty. So how can we get this accurate uncertainty quantification and this accurate robustness quantification from variational Bayes? Well, I'm going to be talking about a sort of, you could think of it as a correction to variational Bayes that will give us this uncertainty quantification and this robustness quantification. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to start off by introducing variational Bayes as an alternative to Markov chain Monte Carlo for posterior approximation. I'm going to talk about the challenges of variational Bayes. So in particular, I'm going to focus on this uncertainty underestimation issue that exists within variational Bayes. And then I'm going to talk about, OK, well, if we're going to do an analysis with variational Bayes where we do care about the uncertainty, how can we correct that? And so I'll talk about how our linear response methods can be used to get this uncertainty quantification from variational Bayes that's more accurate. And then it's going to turn out that we can use very similar ideas, very similar methods to get this robustness quantification that I was talking about as well. And so I'll actually spend quite a bit of time um, sort of delving into the details of the uncertainty quantification, because a lot of that will just roll over to the robustness quantification um, as well. And sort of the big idea throughout all of this is that because variational Bayes sets up a sort of optimization style framework, it's relatively easy to have perturbations or derivatives within that framework. OK, so let's talk about what variational Bayes even is. So with variational Bayes, we have some true posterior out there, our probability of our, um, our parameter given our data. And we want to approximate it with some other distribution. Let's call it Q star. I mean, fundamentally, this is what we're doing in any posterior approximation algorithm. It's true for Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's true for Laplace. It's true for variational Bayes. What's special about variational Bayes is the way that we find Q star. So in particular, you know, let's think about what we wish we were doing. We wish we were working with a nice distribution, a distribution where we could find normalizing constants, where we could find moments like the mean and the covariance and all these things that we were interested in calculating. And the sort of sad fact of life is that our true distribution, our, our target posterior distribution, um, is not one of these nice distributions, with, which I've represented the nice distributions here with some sort of green blob. OK, so what do we do? Uh, we're not working with one of these nice distributions. Well, variational Bayes is going to say, hey, how about we approximate our true posterior distribution here, our p of theta given x, with the closest of the nice distributions. And so in order to make this a well-formed optimization problem, we have to say, what does close mean and what does nice mean? Or what do we mean by, by those um, particular words? So in variational Bayes, uh, when we say close, we mean minimizing the callback Liebler divergence in a particular direction, this direction here. And so um, something you'll notice if you're familiar with the callback Liebler divergence is that actually it's not symmetric, so this is not a distance. OK, so I think a natural thing to ask yourself at this point is why the callback Liebler divergence? Why Kale divergence in this direction? And the fact of the matter is probably the most convincing answer is because this seems to work out really well practically. So people use this a lot in practice. It's enjoyed a lot of practical success, um, in part because it seems to return good point estimates and predictions. People use it all the time for latent Dirichlet allocation, for other models like that, um, for, for clustering, for all kinds of different models. And um, importantly, it's very fast. So if I have a fixed computational budget and I'm not getting a good result from Markov chain Monte Carlo in that time, I can often get a very good result from variational Bayes in that time. And it just has to be better for my computational budget. We also have found that we can run um, this on streaming data. We can make variational Bayes distributed. In our experiments, we've seen that we can run on uh, billions of documents from Wikipedia, all of the documents of, in English language Wikipedia at the particular time stuff we were looking at in just sort of an hour around that. OK, so variational Bayes, it's very fast. Um, it's straightforward to use. 
So why isn't this just the solution to everything? I mean, variational Bayes gives us a full posterior approximation. It gives us this Q star. And so in theory, I should be able to query that for point estimates, for second order moments like covariance, and, or, to, or to get the covariance, and, and all the things that I want, tail probabilities and all of that. Well, the problem is that just because it provides an approximation doesn't mean it's a good approximation. So in particular, let's see what goes wrong with the uncertainty. OK, so let me just write out in a little bit more detail um, the Kale divergence. But before I do that, let's say that we're going to look at a toy example. So we're going to assume that our true posterior for the moment is this simple bivariate Gaussian. So this is just going to be to illustrate exactly what goes wrong with the covariance here. So it's a simple bivariate Gaussian over parameters theta 1 and theta 2. This is our, um, we're imagining this is our, our target posterior. And the thing that we're trying to do with variational Bayes is we're trying to minimize the Kale divergence in this direction between our approximation Q and our target posterior P of theta given x. Well, notice that whenever P of theta given x has very little mass, like in these two corners here, then if Q of theta has mass there, like a lot of mass, then we'll be dividing something very large by something very small. It's, you know, it's sort of blowing up, and the Kale divergence will be quite large. And so when we minimize the Kale divergence, for Q star that minimizes the Kale divergence, it essentially has to have very little mass whenever P of theta given x has very little mass. So in a cartoonish sense, we're fitting our approximating distribution inside our true distribution. So to see what happens there, we still have to fully define our optimization problem. We said what it means to be close, but we need to say what it means to be nice, because we're trying to find the closest of the nice distributions. Well, let's think back to what, it's not, what is nice. When can we calculate normalizing constants? When can we calculate means and covariances and moments and things like that? Well, low dimensional distributions let us do that, right? If we were working with low dimensional distributions, we'd kind of know how to do all of these things. And so the idea of mean field variational Bayes, which is a particular flavor of variational Bayes, is that we assume that our approximating distribution factorizes over the parameters of the model. So essentially, we have this axis-aligned distribution Q. OK, so imagine that we have an axis-aligned distribution. And as I said earlier, when we're trying to fit KL in this direction, it's like we're fitting the approximating distribution inside our P of theta given x, our, our target distribution. So what happens? This is our mean field variational Bayes approximation. OK, well, that's, you know, I guess the point estimate is good, but this is really bad, right? Um, so if we look at the, the variance of the green distribution, the target distribution, it's quite large. And if we look at the variance of the approximating distribution, it's quite small. So we're underestimating the variance. In fact, we can make this arbitrarily bad. And not only that, but that's sort of the wrong direction to misestimate the variance. We're being overly confident. We're saying, yeah, this is definitely the right answer, and we're totally sure of it, even though that's not warranted. And sort of by definition, by this assumption, this mean field variational Bayes assumption, we're getting no information about the covariance, about the way that the parameters covary together. And so if that's of interest, you know, we're just not getting that. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a correction, something that lets us get these variances correctly and these covariances as well. Now, this is a, a well-known problem, by the way, that mean field variational Bayes has this problem. Uh, it's been in textbooks since at least 2003, if not before. Um, people have talked about it for a long time. But it's also a very modern problem. So just in the past few years, a number of people have said, gosh, we have so much data now, um, or we have you know, these very complex models, and we'd love to run Markov chain Monte Carlo on them, but it's, it's far too slow. We could turn to variational Bayes because it's very fast, but you know, I'm in an application where I care about uncertainty, and so I can't. And so what a lot of people have been doing is they've been saying, well, let's take Markov chain Monte Carlo and throw away some of the theoretical guarantees, and that's how it'll get to, we'll get it to run quite fast. And so the approach that I'll be taking in this talk is why don't we start from variational Bayes, which is already quite fast, and then add some correctness. Let's make it more accurate. OK, and the way that we're going to do that is this linear response idea. So before I say exactly what is linear about linear response, let me say at a very high level the sort of intuition that you might have here, which is that if I had access to a cumulant generating function, I'd be set, right? Then I would know the covariance matrix. So just recall that the cumulant generating function is the log of the moment generating function. And when we take derivatives and set that t to 0, we get the cumulants. So if we take the first derivative and set t to 0, we get the first cumulant, which is the mean. And if we take the second derivative and set t to 0, we get the second cumulant, which is the covariance. So here we're going to say that sigma is our true covariance. It's the covariance of our posterior. 
our actual posterior. Um, and so we were taking the cumulative joining function of the actual posterior to get it. But likewise, we have this approximation, Q star, for mean field variational bays. We could also look at the cumulant generating function of that, take the second derivative, and we'd get out the covariance matrix from the mean field variational bays distribution, and that we could call V. And remember, this is the sort of bad block diagonal covariance matrix that underestimates the variance. And so it's not a good approximation to sigma. We want a better approximation. So what are we going to do? Well, let's imagine. And this will be the, the linear response part where we talk about, you know, why is it called linear response? Well, let's imagine that we take our true posterior, our, our target distribution, this P of theta given x, and we take the log, and we apply a linear perturbation to it. OK, well, if we apply this linear perturbation, then that effectively defines a new distribution. We could call it P sub t of theta, as long as we normalize that distribution. And it happens, and you can easily check that this is true, that the normalizing constant is exactly the cumulant generating function. And so the linear response idea, this linear perturbation, contains the information of the cumulant generating function, which in turn contains the information of the covariance, which is what we want. OK, so now I'm going to ask you to imagine something totally crazy that we would never do in practice, but it'll be a thought experiment, and then we'll get to the thing that we actually do in practice. And the totally crazy thing is to say, hey, so we have this continuum of distributions, p sub t at this point. Let's imagine that for every one of those continuum of distributions, this uncountable infinity of distributions, we fit a mean field variational Bayes approximation, q star of t. Now, of course, we wouldn't do that. We only want to fit one of these. Anything more than that would be too expensive. Definitely uncountable infinity would be too expensive. But let's just imagine that we did that for the moment. OK, so where is this going to get us? Well, to, to get our approximation for sigma, which is what we actually want. We want this, this covariance matrix for the posterior. We know that we can't just put in the cumulant generating function for q star for mean field variational Bayes, because that would give us v, which is the bad block diagonal matrix that we don't like. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, let's take this inner derivative. Well, this inner derivative is actually exactly the expectation of theta under p sub t. We think that what we know practically, empirically, about mean field variational Bayes is that it seems to give good point estimates and predictions. But what's relevant here is the point estimates. And so maybe we don't think it's so crazy to say that for every one of these expectations, we can imagine like some continuum of expectations that's going on, that the expectations under q sub t are a good approximation to that. And so that's the approximation we're going to make. We're going to say that the expectations under p sub t are well approximated by the expectations under q sub t star. And we're going to call this our linear response variational Bayes estimate of the covariance. OK, now this isn't a usable formula at this point, because it relies on this continuum of q sub t approximation, so we need to get rid of t. So that's the next step, is getting rid of t and making this into an actual usable formula in practice. OK, so this is the, the sort of unusable formula. We want to turn it into a usable formula. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to make one more assumption. So let's ask ourselves again, what are, what are nice? distributions. So far we said, hey, low dimensional distributions are nice. That's when I can calculate normalizing constants. That's when I can calculate means and covariances and things like that. But you know what's even nicer than low dimensional distributions is exponential families. Those are really nice. That's when I really know my normalizing constants, when I know my moments, when I have everything that I want. And so if we further assume that q sub t is exponential family, which is not totally crazy. This is definitely something people do in practice when they're using mean field variational Bayes in general. Then we know that q sub t is parameterized by some mean parameter, m sub t. And in general, um, the particular q star that we actually use to approximate our true p of theta given x is parameterized by some mean parameter m. Then with a little algebra, we can show that sigma hat, we can actually get rid of this t part. And we can show that it's the inverse of the second derivative of the Kl divergence with respect to this mean parameter. And in fact, we can simplify this even further and it turns out we get this cute little formula, which is essentially we start with V, which is the bad block diagonal covariance matrix that we wish we weren't working with, and we correct it. We apply this correction, this I minus VH inverse correction, where V is, again, you know, the same matrix here, but H is some matrix that depends on the choice of likelihood and prior um, and involves a differentiation, but we can, use it, we can do that with auto differentiation. So it's something that we can calculate in general. OK, so before I go on to some experiments to see how this actually works in practice, let's sort of ask ourselves if this is kind of you know, realistic. What are the assumptions that are going on into this? What do we have to be aware of? 
Well, the first thing to notice from um, this formula that takes the form of a second derivative is that this estimator is symmetric and positive definite at a local minimum of the KL. And we're going to get to a local minimum of the KL by applying any sort of usual mean field variational Bayes optimization procedure. And so we're going to get, in general, a sort of reasonable estimate of a covariance matrix here. Two, we made one assumption. Our assumption was that the means of the mean field variational Bayes optimization problem were well tracked. We're, we're tracking the means of the posterior inference problem. And so if, if that assumption is true, this actually isn't an approximation anymore. This is exact. So for instance, in this multivariate normal example that I gave over here, um, where the you know, actual um, posterior is completely described by its mean and its covariance by its first two moments, then this is just exact. This isn't an approximation anymore. And in general, when we have some distribution that isn't completely described by its first two moments, this will be an approximation. OK, so let's see this in practice. Let's see some examples. Um, so my first example is um, this microcredit example. So the, the sort of high level idea of microcredit is that we're imagining um, we're giving small loans to individuals in developing countries. And the hope is that that might alleviate poverty in some way. Um, and so uh, a colleague of mine at MIT, Rachel Meager, has done a bunch of amazing studies on microcredit and microcredit effectiveness. And I'll definitely recommend that you check out um, her paper on that. That'll, that's the sort of you know, really go-to paper for the economics work behind this. I'm just going to look at a simplified model of this to see how well our method works here. OK, so um, these are real studies, though. This, this was actually a number of randomized controlled trials that were run in different uh, developing countries. And, uh, and we're actually going to look at actual businesses in those countries. Um, so in this case, around 1,000 to 17,000 businesses um, in the different countries. And in this particular sort of simplified example, we're just going to look at one of the outcomes uh, that was measured, in particular the profit of the different businesses. So we're going to model the profit of, um, at the Kth site, which is like the Kth country here, uh, the nth business. So that's YKN. OK, so the model here that we're going to have is that we're going to say that the profit of this business is independently distributed with two sort of components in the mean. So the first one is like a site-specific uh, profit. This is kind of like the mean profit that we would expect if you know, nobody had gone in and tried microcredit, had tried giving out these small loans. Then the second component is sort of the microcredit component. Uh, the first part is there's just an indicator of whether or not microcredit was applied to this business. So this was just part of the randomized control trial. We totally know for every one of these businesses whether or not microcredit was given. And then there's this tau k, which is like the site-specific microcredit effect. It's saying, you know, for this specific site, what is, it, what is the effect of microcredit? Is it raising the profit of these businesses? It could be lowering it. It could be doing nothing. What is that? So that's sort of the parameter of interest for this site. And then finally, there's some site-specific noise. And so being Bayesian, we're saying to ourselves, well, we don't really know mu, we don't know tau, we don't know sigma squared, and so we're going to put some priors over those unknown quantities. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a prior over mu k and tau k across all the different sites. And so this prior is essentially saying, hey, we expect that you know, there might be some differences across these different countries and cities in the application of microcredit and its effectiveness. And that is represented in the fact that we have this prior that yields all of the different sites. But then there's also some shared aspect. And that's the, the shared mu and tau uh, mean in the prior. So this is saying sort of, you know, this tau is like a global microcredit effect. So in some sense, this is really the parameter of interest, this tau. You know, what is, in general, the effect that we might expect from microcredit? And so this is something that we really want to get. OK, so we don't know mu and tau. We don't know the matrix C, um, this covariance matrix. So again, we, we sort of keep putting priors over things. Um, here I have a separation and LKJ prior over C. If you're familiar with this stuff, the inverse Wishart has some bad properties. So this seems to have some nicer properties. Um, and so we end up with this hierarchical model. And so what we want to do at this point is we want to say, well, let's get the posterior over the various parameters of this model. So let's identify what those parameters are. So the parameters of this model are mu k and tau k across all k 1 through 7, the mu and tau, the elements of c, and sigma squared. So our posterior is going to be over all of those parameters. OK, so the first thing that we want to do, well, we would want to check that we're getting good um, posterior means anyway. But remember that getting good posterior means was what we assumed we were doing in order to apply linear response variational Bayes to get the uncertainties. So it's also a check that we're going to be get, getting correct uncertainties from this method. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to try mean field variational Bayes. We're just going to run mean field variational Bayes. And we're going to compare it to Markov chain Monte Carlo as ground truth. And so I think at this point, you're like, oh, gosh, 
well, why didn't you just run Markov Chain Monte Carlo? But again, there's this issue that Markov Chain Monte Carlo can be quite slow. So he, even here where we're using this sort of awesome, um, easy to use STAN package, which is very optimized, and I think in general is just a really great um, resource for the community, um, it does take on the order of tens of minutes. Whereas if we run mean field variational bays together with linear response variational bays uncertainty calculation, together with a bunch of sensitivity measures, which I haven't yet shown you, but I will show you soon, this all takes less than a minute. And this is not optimized code. This is just code that we put together for this. And we're not taking advantage of any sort of um, uh, parallelization or anything like that here. OK, so we want to use this because it's quite fast. So it can lead to sort of you know, nice checking of models and, and sort of you know, checking uh, what, what you're doing and easily going through a lot of different analyses. And so now we want to see, are we, in fact, getting the means right when we do this? And luckily, that seems to be the case. So here we're running mean field variational bays. And again, what we're plotting here is every one of these points is one of the parameters of the model. And we're checking the posterior mean returned by mean field variational bays on the vertical axis and the posterior mean returned by Markov chain Monte Carlo on the horizontal axis. And the line is x equals y. And you see that they agree. Um, something that's a little weird here is there's actually an or a, a bunch of orange dots for the C um, covariance parameter. And that's just not on the key. But they're in the plot as well. OK, so, but we were really interested in saying, OK, we know mean field variational Bayes seems to return good point estimates. Well, we want to get accurate uncertainties. So is linear response doing that? And so here what we're doing is we're plotting mean field variational Bayes uncertainties, again, for each one of the parameters of the model. And we're plotting the same parameters with the linear response variational Bayes uncertainties. And as expected, mean field variational Bayes is underestimating those uncertainties, because again, the line is sort of x equals y. And linear response variational Bayes is getting us more accurate uncertainties. OK, and th this is really important to this kind of analysis in general. So just again, as, as an example of what you would be doing here is you can imagine, oh, I'm really interested in this, this microcredit effect. You know, is microcredit um, really, really uh, a useful thing to be doing in general? Is this a good policy? Um, and you know, if you use this particular simplified model, you'll find, oh, um, the mean of tau, this microcredit effect, is 3.08 US dollars purchasing power parity. The standard deviation is 1.83. And so uh, the mean is 1.68 standard deviations from zero. And so you might say to yourself, oh, God, gosh, this isn't two standard deviations from zero. I don't think that the probability of, of this microcredit effect being negative or negligible is, um, is low enough. And so I actually don't feel comfortable maybe instituting this as policy. But you can imagine if I had run mean field variational Bayes instead of linear response variational Bayes, I would have had a lower uncertainty. I would have been more confident. And I might have said to myself, gosh, it does pass two standard deviations. I am going to implement this as policy. So that's the kind of sort of analysis that you can do. And again, I'll recommend that you check out Rachel Meager's paper for an actual more detailed analysis of the various sort of um, uh, different covariates that might influence microcredit and things like that. OK, so let me do a few more experiments. So this was a particular real data experiment that we were just looking at, um, an experiment on, on these actual microcredit um, randomized controlled trials that were run. What's nice about simulated data is that we can look at a ton of different models all at the same time. And so that's what we're going to do here. So let's imagine a Gaussian mixture model now, just to get a, a broader sense of different models that are out there. Here we're imagining that we essentially have k clusters. Um, each of the clusters is Gaussian distributed. And we want to say, hey, we want to learn like the means of the clusters and the shapes of the clusters and the probability of each data point belonging to different clusters and so on. And so again, we simulate data um, and we compare it to uh, running Markov chain Monte Carlo as our ground truth. And as before, so here we're looking at the, the mean cluster parameters, sort of the center of the different clusters. We see that mean field variational Bayes is underestimating the uncertainty and linear response is getting it right. Um, for the pro cluster proportions, the proportion of data points in each cluster, we again see mean field variational Bayes underestimating. For the off-diagonal covariances, which I didn't show in the previous example, um, but here I'm, I'm illustrating how we can actually get off-diagonal covariances, whereas mean field variational Bayes doesn't provide those. Um, we also looked at some MNIST data, some real, um, although very well studied data, um, and we got the same sort of results. So here we're looking at the shape parameter, but it's, it's all kind of the same. Um, we can also look at a non-conjugate normal Poisson model. Here it's a model for count data. So you imagine that the actual data you observe at the end of the day is like some sort of integer. Um, we did the same thing. We simulated a bunch of data points and compared um, both. And, and let me just highlight, too, in, in this slide and the previous slide, each data point that I'm showing in this plot is actually one simulation of an entire um, data set, whereas when I was showing the microcredit points, each, each point was actually um, just a parameter in the model. So it's a slight difference there. OK, so 
so here I just want to highlight something about where does linear response variational Bayes break down. Well, remember that it relies on the mean being estimated correctly. So when, in fact, we, we do that with mean field variational Bayes, we get as expected that while mean, for, mean field variational Bayes underestimates the uncertainty, a linear response gets it right. But what if that doesn't happen? What if, in fact, we're, we're not getting the mean correctly in mean field variational Bayes? Then we don't expect this to get the linear response variational Bayes uncertainty correctly. So here we're seeing that while, while it's still sort of better and not as conservative or not as um, sort of uh, you know, overly confident as mean field variational Bayes, it's, it's not correct. And so that's where this, we expect this to break down. Um, and we do get these off-diagonal covariances again. OK, another thing that you might be concerned about is this formula contains a matrix inverse. And so, you know, this is, we're thinking about big data in this conference. So imagine that I have uh, a huge data set. And I have n data points. And imagine that I'm doing something like clustering. Well, in clustering, I have a bunch of global parameters, sort of the cluster centers and the shapes of the clusters. But then I have a bunch of local parameters. Each data point has some parameter that tells me which cluster it belongs to. And so if the size of this matrix, these V and H matrices, is number of parameters by number of parameters, then I might have essentially an inverse that I'm doing on something like an N by N matrix. And I'd be really concerned about that. But luckily, we can get away, away from that. And so here's what happens. So we can decompose our parameter vector into these global parameters. Again, parameters that are not specific to individual data points. They just have some sort of fixed cardinality. And these local parameters, which might be you know, growing with the size of the data. So here, alpha could be the global parameters, and z could be the local parameters. And we can also decompose h and v into the global and local parameters. OK, now we can take the sure complement to get this sort of you know, fancier formula. But what's important here is that this inverse is going to be on the size of the global parameters. And let's, let's pretend for the moment that that's fine, that we don't care so much about the cardinality of the global parameters, because we're really interested in what happens as the number of data points grows. And then we have this inverse that's on the order of the number of local parameters. So that's the one that we're really concerned with for the moment, at least. Well, it turns out that in sort of most problems of interest, V and H here will have a block diagonal structure in the local parameters that means that this ends up being linear. So well, V is always block diagonal. That was the problem with V. Remember, we didn't like it because it was block diagonal. It gets rid of all of the covariance information, um, and so it just has this sort of block diagonal structure. But H is essentially expressing um, the prior in the global parameters, typically, and the likelihood. And the way that the likelihood often works in these cases is that you'll have something like a term for each of the local parameters. And so what ends up happening is that when we take the log, these local parameters are separated out, and we get this block diagonal structure in the local parameters. And so that's what's happening here. Um, you're seeing that the block diagonal part is actually the part corresponding to the local parameters. And so when we end up taking this inverse over the, um, the local parameter component, it ends up being that it's block diagonal and the number of blocks is n. And so it actually is a linear operation in the number of data points rather than a cubic operation. So that's OK. Now, that being said, you could still be concerned about the number of global parameters, and rightly so. so um, so let's consider again this Gaussian mixture model. So we're imagining that we have clustering again with k clusters. Each data point exists in a p-dimensional space, we'll imagine. And um, the number of data points is n. So then we can say, OK, well, the number of global parameters is going to grow as something like p squared, because you can imagine something like this, this covariance matrix is going to have p by p, or this shape matrix, um, lambda. The number of parameters um, that are local is going to grow as n. So the overall scaling looks pretty bad. I mean, the scaling in n is fine. It's linear, but the scaling in p is, is not so great. And so while we get this nice comparison in running time, so here we have a, a log running time axis vertically that we says, you know, when we get up to hundreds of thousands of data points, it takes LRVB something like four seconds, um, and it takes Gibbs sampling more like thousands of seconds, um, and we get this nice linear scaling with n, we don't get really good scaling with the dimensionality of the space, p. It turns out to be more like cubic, but that's still pretty bad. Um, and so certainly you can get around this if you have structure in your problem, but it's harder to get around when you don't. And so actually, I'm, I'm totally willing to believe that somebody in this room has interesting insights into this, and I'd love to, to talk to you about it um, maybe, maybe afterwards. But we do have this scaling, and so we do have to be concerned about the dimension of the problem growing. OK, 
So we've talked about variational Bayes as an alternative to MCMC. Uh, we've talked about how it's nice because it's fast. Um, but it does have these challenges, like estimating the uncertainty is a big challenge. Um, and getting these accurate uncertainties uh, is something that we can do by applying this linear, variational, linear response variational based correction. And so now I'm going to talk about how we can also get accurate robustness quantification using a similar idea. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to play the same game. Uh, we're going to start from Bayes' theorem. And here what I'm going to do to emphasize that we're really interested in when we perturb the prior, how much does the posterior inference change? To do that, I'm going to emphasize that there's some hyperparameter choice that we're making typically. So like if I have a Gaussian prior, then I have to choose the mean and the covariance matrix. Um, or more generally, I don't have to be choosing some Euclidean hyperparameter. It could be some functional you know, derivative that I'm considering, um, but I'm just gonna pretend that it's Euclidean for the moment. Okay, so this is Bayes' theorem when we include hyperparameters, let's call this hyperparameter alpha. I guess that's an unfortunate notational overload of alpha as the global parameter, but it's totally different this time. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna just abbreviate my posterior as P alpha of theta. And so remember, we're interested in this sensitivity idea, this idea of if I start off with a set of hyperparameters and priors, do I get essentially the same posterior inference or do I get really different posterior inference? What's going to happen? And so in order to think about you know, what exactly it is we want to quantify here, let's imagine what are we really reporting at the end of the day with our posterior inference? Well, typically we're reporting some functional. So for instance, uh, probably the most popular thing to report would be a posterior mean. Uh, for instance, if we're thinking about this microcredit example from before, we'd say, what's the mean microcredit effect? What's the mean effect of applying microcredit on the profit of businesses? And so if G is the identity here, then we would be looking at the posterior mean. And so what we really want to know is how much does this output of our analysis, something like the posterior mean, change when we change alpha? And so in that sense, we're really interested in a derivative, the derivative of something like the posterior mean with respect to alpha. Now, at this point, I really want you to notice that this looks very similar to what we were doing for uncertainties, for this linear response analysis. In the linear response analysis, we said we had the derivative of an expectation with respect to P sub T of theta. So we had basically this expectation under a continuum of T values. So T was the index. And here we're essentially doing the same thing. Imagine again that G is just the identity. Now we have the expectation under P sub alpha, and we're taking a derivative with respect to the index again. So it's really the same setup that we had before. And so we can play the same game. We can say, well, if we think that expectations are well approximated by mean field variational Bayes, then maybe we're willing to make this approximation for the sensitivity. And then this will be our linear response variational Bayes estimator of the sensitivity now instead of, of the covariance. But it's a similar idea. OK, so again, you know, this isn't um, a formula that we can use in practice because it requires us to, to have um, posterior approximations over all the values of alpha, over a countable infinity of alpha. And so what we really want to do is we want to simplify this. We'll play the same game we did before. We'll say Q sub alpha is in the exponential family. And then we can get out a nice formula. So here I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Um, so if G is the identity, if we're actually interested in a posterior mean, then A is the identity matrix. So A somehow expresses the, the G um, structure. And if um, we're dealing with a uh, sort of conjugate exponential family, then B will be the identity. So it sort of represents the prior structure. And this matrix in the middle is exactly the matrix that we calculated from linear response variational Bayes estimate of the covariance. So we already sort of have that hanging around if we did that in our analysis. Okay, so let's look back at this microcredit example. So remember, in this microcredit example, we had a bunch of different hyperparameters that we've chosen. We've chosen uh, mu naught, tau naught, lambda, a, b, eta, c, and d. And even if we're some super microcredit expert like Rachel Meager, we might still think to ourselves, hey, there's probably, for just any person who is out there, a range of possible hyperparameter values that you think is OK. Now, it might be much smaller for somebody who's an expert versus somebody who's a non-expert, but there's still always going to be a range. And you just want to know if over that range, you're going to get fundamentally the same inference. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to check, as before, that our assumption for linear response variational Bayes holds. In this case, it's this assumption of the means, if we're going to be looking at the posterior means. And we already checked that in the previous experiment. And now what we're going to do is we're going to check that we get the sensitivities right. So in order to check against Markov chain Monte Carlo, we have to think about how to do that. Because again, this linear response variational Bayes estimator of the sensitivity is providing us 
uh, derivative in the, in respect, with respect to all of the different hyperparameters, but we don't automatically get that out of Mark, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so in order to compare, what we're going to do is sort of the traditional thing. We're going to take two sets of hyperparameters and run posterior inference at each of those sets. So in particular, we're going to look at lambda 1, 1 equals to 0.03, and all of the other values are fixed, and lambda 1, 1 equals to 0.04, and all of the other values are fixed. And we're going to compare the sensitivity um, for, that we approximate with MCMC and with LRVB. And we find that, again, across all of these different parameters of the model, that these sensitivities really agree. OK, now in general, we're interested in particular, not just in all of these different parameters, but in the sensitivity of the microcredit effect. Um, and we're going to normalize this on to be on the scale of tau standard deviation. So what this is saying is if I perturb each of these hyperparameters, this is what I'm going to get out in terms of perturbations in tau standard deviations. And you can see it's on a really different scale for those first three than the second three. So here we're looking at tens of tau standard deviations on top and just hundredths of tau standard deviations on the bottom. And so the way that you might use this analysis is you might come back and say, OK, remember our analysis from before? We saw, saw that the um, mean microcredit effect is like three US dollars. Um, and we ended up with a mean that's 1.68 standard deviations from zero. And so we can imagine that, OK, well, what if I feel you know, a week later that I actually would have been totally fine with lambda 1, 1 being 0.04 higher? Then this first red bar at the top here tells me that if I perturb lambda 1, 1 by 0.04, I expect to perturb tau by 8.88 times 0.04 standard deviations. In this case, that'll turn out to give me a mean that's over two standard deviations from zero. Now, maybe that analysis won't change too much, but you could imagine things going the other way. What if I had started with an analysis that told me the mean was over two standard deviations from zero, I perturbed it, and then I got a mean that was under two standard deviations from zero. Again, maybe I would just sort of feel like I need to do more analysis before I really recommend this as policy. OK, so we have this linear response variational Bayes estimate for um, getting these more accurate uncertainties within variational Bayes, but also these robustness measures, which again are something that people have really wanted in Bayesian inference for a long time. Um, and we're hoping that this provides sort of a fast, easy to use way to get them automatically. Um, and we're interested in taking this further. So if you have a Bayesian model where you're interested in sensitivity to the prior, I'd be interested to talk to you. Um, also, if you have a model where you're interested in sensitivity to the likelihood or data. Um, so I haven't talked about that here, but you know, the likelihood is a choice you have to make too. Uh, the data, we're often interested in outliers and things like that. And so it would be interesting to talk about these as well. So let me just point you to our paper. So we, um, our work on accurate covariance estimates is in uh, NIPS from 2015. Uh, we have a workshop paper on the robustness work, but we're still working on the journal paper. Hopefully that will be up soon. And then let me just mention this, this other work um, that will be appearing in NIPS 2016. So one thing that is somewhat disconcerting for some people about variational Bayes is that there aren't theoretical guarantees about the quality of posterior inference. And so that's also true here in this uncertainty case. And so if you really do care about theoretical guarantees that you're, you know, as close as you want to be um, to uh, a certain posterior, um, then something that you can do in a case where we are able to provide theoretical guarantees is this core sets idea. And so the idea here is let's run some pre-processing algorithm on our data to have a small and fast summary of our data. And because this is going to be a smaller data set, we can then apply our original, you know, whatever posterior approximation methodology, be it MCMC or variational Bayes or whatever, and we can get guarantees, theoretical guarantees on the quality of inference in that case. Thank you. Hopefully. Thank you.